Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Sometimes attributed to Edmund Burke is the notion that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. In spite of the supposed transparency of the internet age, more and more we live in an age of complicity. This past month, we saw it with the trove of documents and stories that came to light about Uber. Tim Miller's recent book about Trump's enablers shows how it happened repeatedly in the White House, just as several authors and journalists showed us how it happened on Wall Street in the lead-up to the 2008 financial crisis. And for over 20 years, the complicity around the actions of Harvey Weinstein seemed airtight. What is it about Wall Street and Washington and Hollywood that encourages and even condones such complicity to bad behavior. We're going to talk about that today as I'm joined by longtime media journalist Ken Oletta, who tells the 30,000-foot story of Harvey Weinstein, his rise and fall, in part through the lens of his enablers and his victims. Ken Oletta inaugurated the Annals of Communications column and profiles in The New Yorker. He's the author of 12 previous books, including Three Blind Mice, and Greed and Glory on Wall Street, and it is my pleasure to welcome Ken Oletta back to this program to talk about his newest work, Hollywood Ending, Harvey Weinstein and the Culture of Silence. Ken Oletta, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Well, it's great to have you here. You've been studying Weinstein for over 20 years now. You wrote this famous profile about him in, in The New Yorker all those many years ago. What is it about Weinstein that it, that is fascinating enough to keep your interest and the public interest in him going for so long? Well, after he was exposed in in, in the fall of 2017, um, and and we learned through the brilliant reporting of the two times reporters and Ronan Farrow at the New Yorker of, of his beastly behavior, uh, questions that still lingered in my mind. For instance. What made Harvey Weinstein the monster he became? For instance, how did uh, he had enormous power? How did he use that power and abuse that power? Also, how how come he got away for four, more than four decades with this behavior? And people who knew he was cheating on his wife and who should have known he was doing more than that, he was abusing women, how come they kept silent? What enabled this? And and the other thing that really intrigued me was the relationship between Harvey and his younger brother, Bob. They were business partners, best friends. And in the end, uh, Harvey sucker punched his brother, broke his nose. And in the end, his brother in the fall of 2017 supplied the critical vote to fire Harvey Weinstein from the Weinstein Company. Talk a little bit about Weinstein's early years, and and when you look at his his upbringing and 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 what he did as a kid. I mean, if anything, he was a nerd. They weren't really early signs of any of this kind of sociopathic behavior. Absolutely. I mean, I, I spent time delving into his his youth in Queens, and and then when he attended the University of Buffalo after that, and talking to his friends, people who grew up with him, I found no evidence. That, that Harvey was abusing women through junior high school, high school, and even the first three years at the University of Buffalo. He only began to abuse women when he had power. And he gained power as a rock promoter in Buffalo when he dropped out of the university there. And for the next 10 years, he ran a company called Harvey and Corky Presents. They got Sinatra up there. They got the Rolling Stones, Billy Joel. They were very successful. And only then, after he had power, did power become a kind of an aphrodisiac and he began to abuse women. And the first woman that I could find that he raped was one of his assistants at Harvey and Corky presents hope to more. And, um, you, you see also in his childhood, some evidence as to why he was yelling all the time and angry. His mother, Miriam was, was a very powerful woman. She ruled that household, but she yelled all the time. In fact, she yelled so much that the friends who played poker with Harvey every weekend at a different house refused to play poker at the Weinstein house because Miriam was always yelling, Harvey, you're too fat. Harvey, stop doing that. Harvey, this, Harvey, that. And they were embarrassed by it. And and Harvey at, at one point called her Mama Portnoy after Portnoy's complaint. But in any case, the yelling that was common in Harvey's office in later years at Miramax and the Weinstein Company was, was a direct extension of the kind of yelling that he 
thought was normal that Miriam Weinstein did in the house. But that doesn't explain uh, his, his sexual behavior. And I think so, being a sociopath is a closer explanation to why. Was there a moment, was there some woman anywhere in his youth that that turned him down or did something that was some kind of a turning point for his life? I could find none, no. Uh, I mean, he did have a girlfriend in Buffalo for a period of time, and, and she broke up with him. But I, I can't find any evidence that it was it was some momentous event in his life and, and a life-changing experience. Talk about that relationship with his mother. Well, his mother, you know, was – he would always all through – she loved the fact that the movie company Miramax was named after her and her husband, Max, and would often go sit in movies just to watch the ending and, and kind of glow at, at the movie being named, the movie company being named after her. But she, Harvey would, would treat her with great respect, as would the brother Bob. And would bring her, you know, to screenings. And she was in the early days. She would come to the office and bring cookies and arugula for the staff. And and many people thought of her as a kindly grandmother almost. Uh, but sometimes people would see the the tough side of Miriam that that Harvey and his brother experienced as kids. I once asked Bob, who who cooperated extensively for for this book. I said, Bob, what do you see? of your father in Harvey. And he looked at me and without hesitation, he said, I don't see my father in Harvey. I see my mother in Harvey. She was a dominant person in that household. The father was a diamond cutter. He would come, often come home late. Marion would have dinner with the two boys. Uh, she was the dominant force in that house. There was also the sense that, that what Harvey got away with, the complicity around it, the actions that he took, even the yelling, to, to a large extent, that those are things that only could have existed and, and that he could have gotten away with in very specific areas, and the entertainment business was certainly one of them. Well, there's no question that, that the, quote, casting couch uh, has a long history in, in Hollywood. Hollywood is one of the few worlds, uh, business worlds, where beautiful young women are in such close proximity to their bosses, be they directors or casting directors or actors or, or studio heads. Um, and, and, and so naturally uh, they, they t many men over the years have taken advantage of these women and claimed it was casting couch stuff. But when you rape a woman, that's not casting couch. Harvey would defend himself by saying, this is just casting couch, We're not my relationship with these younger women. But it wasn't casting couch. If you violently rape someone, uh, you're committing a criminal offense. And that's what the jury found him guilty of. But Hollywood is, is, is a world where young, attractive women are have been more taken advantage of than, than in most other industries. But on the other hand, if you're a politician, and I've covered politicians, and, and, and you, you've got a big ego, as people in Hollywood may have a big ego, and, and some attractive person who works with you says, oh, Mr. So-and-so, your speech was wonderful, or oh, Mr. So-and-so, I love the movie you did. Oftentimes, a narcissist will confuse the compliment with a come on and see what the woman is, is really trying to do is get into, into bed with me. And they take advantage of that. Talk about Harvey's marriages, his wives. Well, he's married twice. He was married to Eve Chilton, the first wife, um, who was his assistant at Miramax at one point. Uh, they got married. She came from a, a very prominent uh, family that went back to the Mayflower. Her, one of her relatives was the first attorney general of the United States. She had a house in Martha's Vineyard and, and, and membership in, in one of the great clubs on the island, which actually didn't allow many Jewish people, not to mention Italians or people of color. And, and Harvey was suddenly a member when he was married to Eve. And he divorced Eve after he met um, Georgina Chapman in the early 80s in London and wound up marrying her in, the, in uh, close to the mid-80s. Um, she was a, a 
fashion design, a very successful one, uh, on, with Harvey's help, and and they had two they had two little kids, a boy and a girl. Eve, they had three daughters who they adopted um, um, with Eve. Those three daughters no longer speak to Harvey since he's been exposed. The the boy and the girl from his second marriage. Um, would, would see Harvey all the time. He, everything I could report, he was a, attentive and a good parent. Uh, but he's in California waiting trial there, and they're obviously not not seeing him. And there's no internet connection, so he's not emailing or capable of emailing people. So the, the women, both wives, refused to talk to me, and I found out because they each signed with Harvey a non-disclosure agreement, agreeing never to talk about the other. But I talked to their friends to describe their attitude and their shock, they say, at, at his behavior. They're claiming they didn't know that. Talk about that complicity, because there are so many people that have said over the years, even going back to your original story at, in The New Yorker, that they didn't really know or they're, they were surprised or, or what have you. This complicity went on for so many years among so many different groups of people. It's quite remarkable in that respect. Uh, totally remarkable. One of the reasons my subtitle of the book is uh, the, the, you know, the culture of silence is because people, everyone who worked with Harvey and most people in Hollywood who knew him knew that he was cheating on his wives. And, and, but they cl most claim they didn't know he was abusing women. Now, I think some of those people obviously knew, and some who did know, I, I, I name in the, in the book, but people who, who claim they didn't know, many of them, I believe, should have known, and they just closed their ears and eyes to it and didn't want to know. They wanted to continue in business. They didn't want to send Harvey. They wanted to continue upwardly mobile careers. Uh, but they should have known, and they should, and knowing they should have spoken out, and it enabled Harvey over four decades to abuse so many women. If Harvey had been called out on this early on, would it have made a difference? Well, I think it would have. Sure, I mean, if 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 you call out someone, and then you can prove that they actually committed a crime, as, as happened when he was called out in 2017 and found guilty in 2020 in a trial. If you would have had that trial earlier, I mean, he'd be in prison. He wouldn't be able to, you know, be raping women um, or or he would have been so shamed and people would have been so on guard and his career and power would have dissipated that he wouldn't be able to do it anyway, even if he didn't have a trial. So it would have I, I knew had I been able to crack the case in 2002 when I confronted him and, and he denied it, but I couldn't get the women who I believe he had abused at the Venice Film Festival in 1998 while making Shakespeare in Love, if I had gotten them to speak, which I couldn't, uh, therefore I, we could, the New York couldn't write the story. And we had his denial, and we had no one affirming that he actually committed these acts. And, uh, and then he was exposed for the very first time in 2015 in the press, and the police actually apprehended him for allegedly admitting that he grabbed the breasts of this Italian model. But then the case was not brought by the district attorney, thinking it was a weak case. And Harvey escaped once again until 2017, when he was brought down by some terrific reporters at the Times and, and the New Yorker. Talk a little bit about the power and the fear that he generated that, that really enabled him for so long to to get people to be complicitous, to cover this up. Well, Harvey was a yeller, the way his mother was a yeller. And he, he was fearsome in the office. He would throw ashtrays at people. He would, he would, uh, he would on Route 95 on a highway, he would get angry as an assistant and get him out of the car, get out of the car. Harvey, uh, you're on a highway. I don't care. Get out of the car. And he would literally deposit them on a highway to walk whoever, you know, to, to get home or get back to the office. He was just a scary person. And, and so people were afraid of him. And, and they knew that, that he was litigious. He might bring charges against them. They knew, as several actresses have claimed, that he blackballed them from, from getting parts in other movies. Um, he was just a fearsome person. And he loved that. He believed that, it, that the key to power 
was fear. Donald Trump believes the same thing. People have to fear you, they think. And, and people feared Harvey. And so they kept their mouth shut. But he was also very good at manipulating the press. He got the press to love him. He did. And that was another reason for fear. People knew that Harvey had friends in the press. And, and here, think about this. I mean, the press it, it loves salacious stories, right? Witness, we're watching now with, with, with uh, you know, Sergey Brin's wife supposedly having had an affair with, with um, Musk. I'm sorry. And yet people would hear rumors about Harvey today. Who pursued it in the press? The press was, was eating out of the hand of Harvey. They wanted to be invited to his screenings. They wanted to meet the actors and, and be behind the scenes. They wanted him leaks from Harvey about things that were going on. Harvey was constantly talking about us. Or they wanted, they wanted a contract to write books for talk books, which Harvey owned. Or they wanted screenplay contracts, both of which he gave out pretty liberally to members of the press. So the press, too much of the press was in Harvey's pocket. Talk a little bit about the work and what Harvey accomplished and the degree to which his sociopathy was also part of, of what made him successful with respect to the movie business. I mean, Harvey had real talent. First of all, he, he was a good reader. He read a lot, unlike a lot of studio heads. And he read the scripts and he believed that you could have a good director and good actors, but if you have a lousy script, it's going to be a lousy movie. And he understood that. So he, he could literally determine whether it was a good movie or not, just on the script. He had, he had an ability to have great charm, and he was doing important movies. If you're a serious actor or director, you don't want to be making sequels for Batman. It, it may be lucrative, but you want to win an Academy Award. And to win an Academy Award, you want to be in a, in a good movie. And Miramax was making good and many good movies. And, and so it, they gravitated to want to work with Harvey. It was just a natural. And, and Harvey then had this ability to, to market a movie, to understand. He had unbelievable empathy to understand what, what the audience, the consumer, might want to watch and how to, how to shape a message that would appeal to that audience. And one of the great ironies and dichotomies and contradictions in this book as I'm doing it, here's a man who had the empathy to really psych out an audience and an audience reaction and to appeal to actors and directors to be in his movies. And on the other hand, had no empathy at all for the women he was abusing. If you watched him in the trial, as the women were describing the, the hard things he did to them, sometimes he would fall asleep. He had zero empathy for them. And so that's an amazing contradiction that, that I try to explore in the book. I don't have a good answer for it. How come he could be empathetic in, in, in understanding the, the public or appealing to individuals and yet not empathetic to, to the women he was victimizing? I mean, I guess the question there is the degree to which he had enough self-awareness within his sociopathy whether there was enough self-awareness to understand that as long as he made those kind of movies as opposed to horror movies or, or rom-coms or what have you, that if he made serious movies with serious actors, that it would in some ways cover up or help to cover up in literally and in his own mind the, the behavior that he engaged in. I actually don't think that thought ran through his mind. The question, uh, when Harvey and I had email exchanges when he was in prison, I asked him, one of the questions I asked him, which he did not answer, w which gets to the heart of what you're saying and, and, and my response to it. I said, Harvey, when you, after you raped, let's say, Jessica Mann, who was one of the witnesses against him in, in his criminal trial, after you raped Jessica Mann and you put your head on a pillow at night, how did you explain to yourself what you had just done? And I think the answer to that is Harvey didn't explain to himself what he had just done. Harvey had, has no guilt, like a sociopath. A sociopath has no guilt, no empathy, and, and is a narcissist. Those are the three definitions of, 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 of a sociopath. Harvey thinks of himself as a victim, 
not a villain. He thinks of himself as having had a consensual affair, that Jessica Mann wanted to sleep with him. And, and, and even if she had some resistance, she wanted something from me, a role in Hollywood, and I wanted something from her, sex. It was a fair trade. It was, con- it was, a, it was a casting couch casting couch on steroids. It was on steroids because one of the things about Harvey is that he was not an attractive guy. It's not like he came on with good looks and charm. But, you know, his power made him think he did have better looks and and more charm. I mean, he would, when he came to, when he, when he went to another city, let's say London or Rome or, or LA, he would often, he would stay in a hotel suite. And his assistant would work there. He would go out to dinner, and then he'd come back. And as soon as he came back, he would often shed all of his clothes. And Zelda Perkins, who was his assistant in London, the first time he did this, she said, Harvey, what are you doing? Why are you taking off your clothes? He said, oh, come on, Zelda. It's hot in here. I want to be comfortable. What do you, what, what's, uh, this is normal. He would try to normalize his aberrant behavior. And so he'd parade around the, the hotel suite as if he had a glorious – uh, you know, a body. And of course, he, was, he had a blubbery body. Talk a little bit about Harvey's reactions when he realized he was going to be outed, when, when things started to fall apart. How did he respond? Well, it's interesting. I, I actually, what I tried to do at the beginning of 2017 and tell me a story, at the beginning of 2017 is what Harvey, when Harvey realized that there were people out there who might expose him. Um, actresses who had signed non-disclosure agreements or writing memoirs who might come forward. Actresses who he had abused, who he had heard rumors they were talking to Ronan Farrow at, at, you know, at NBC News at the time and later the New Yorker when he heard that New York Times might be doing an investigation. I tried to tell the story getting inside Harvey Weinstein and describing it not from the glass looking in on him, but from, the, from him looking out on the world as, as his world is crumbling. And he hires, he goes out and hires Black Cube, a security firm. And Ronan Farrow uh, explained dramatically how this firm operated, it, it made up of many ex Mossad agents. And he would hire them to spread false rumors or to gather information about what Annabelle Sciorra is saying to Ronan Farrow. Or, or what someone is saying in their book about me, or do pretend to be reporters and call up people, call up Ken Oletta, call up Ron Farrow, call up, and find out what, whether they're working on any stories about me. But he was in a panic mo- mode, and, and that's what he was doing in that period of time. And at one point in the summer, when he was really worried about NBC and Ron Farrow, he was told by, by late July, he was told by NBC news executives that they had killed the Ronan Farrow reporting on him. They told him this more than a week before they told Ronan Farrow that he was out at NBC News. So Harvey, but, and then, so he's constantly putting his finger in the, in the holes in the dike and keep the water from, from drowning him. But then in the end, when the Time story appears in early October of, of 2017, and a week later, Ronan Farrow's story appears in The New Yorker, Harvey drowned. And, and at that point, the board fired him with the vote of his brother, Bob, being the critical vote to fire him, and Harvey's career was over. Other than the success that he had making and marketing movies at Miramax, what is it in Harvey Weinstein's character or life or anything else that one could consider positive or virtuous that, that provides any countervailing actions to what we've seen? Well, he was very philanthropic. He raised a lot of money for AIDS research for the AMFOR, the organization that, that, that did that. He had for, for first responders after 9-11, um, Harvey was a, gave money. He was he was very philanthropic, and 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 a b he he produced and distributed an amazing array of movies, movies that may not have gotten to the big screen without his support. Um, 
So, and, you know, I mean, those are, are virtuous. I mean, it, it's not, I would not dismiss them. Um, now, he used them to, you know, for, to aggrandize his power and, and to, later to abuse his power. But Harvey, Harvey is not just a monster. Harvey Weinstein is, is like most of us, has complications and, and has sides that, that are more attractive than others. But on balance, if you read my book, you're going to say he's a monster, but hopefully you'll also say, God, he also is talented. And he's a kind of an interesting guy, and I want to know more about it. And that's what provoked me to write the book. What do we learn about Hollywood in general from this story? You learn that, that there's, as, as there is in politics, with if you watch the Republican Party uh, denying that Donald Trump uh, you know, uh, lost the election, when Trump is spreading that big lie. And in Harvey's case, you know, the, the Hollywood community uh, sucking it up, keeping their mouth shut, and allowing a Harvey Weinstein to do monstrous things. By the way, not just to women uh, abusing them sexually, but he was abusing people, as I, did, as I described in my 2000 New Yorker profile. Of him. He was abusing people in Hollywood regularly and getting away with it. And abusing people who work for him, throwing ashtrays at them, calling them dopes, uh, and humiliating them. He was, he, was, he was a guy who really had impulse control. He could not control his temper, just as he could not control his sexual urges. And, and all of it was part of something very similar. Harvey was about conquest. He wanted to conquer people, people who worked for him, women who, who sought his favor. I mean, he's a classic case, I suppose, of, of no one being as bad as the worst thing they've done or as, or as good as the best thing. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and finally, after all this time that you've spent looking at Harvey Weinstein, what surprised you the most of, of all of the things that you learned about him? I, the mother surprised me. Miriam's power over him and... And, and her the influence she had on him and his behavior. I don't mean his sexual behavior. I have no, I, I wouldn't link her. I have no reason to link her to his sexual misbehavior. But I have reason to link her to the way he treated people, yelling at them, uh, abusing them. She was, you know, she, she had charm, as he sometimes had charm. And she had power, as he had power. Um, and she had friends, and she could be generous, bring cookies and arugula to the office for the staff in the early days of Miramax. But she was a fearsome sight. And I once asked Bob Weinstein, I said, Bob, what do you see of your father in Harvey and your brother? And he said, I don't see my father. I see my mother in Harvey. And I, that was very revealing. And so I was surprised to learn more about Miriam. I was also surprised to learn that Harvey was not did not abuse women when he was younger, and and he really didn't start abusing women until he had power, in, in the in, in the music promotion business and then in Hollywood. Ken Oletta, the book is Hollywood Ending: Harvey Weinstein and the Culture of Silence. Ken, always a pleasure. I thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Jeff. Enjoyed it. Thank you.